Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Well, like many of you, I suspect, I am not terribly fond of going to the dentist. Now, let me just say, if you are a dentist, or if you have a dentist in your family, or if you have a friend who's a dentist, I love dentists. They're awesome. I just don't like going to them. I think I had a bad experience, traumatic experience as a child, and as a result, I suffer from dentophobia. Did you know that's a real thing? You can look it up, dentophobia. I think I have it. I once went 13 years from age 19 to age 32 without going to see the dentist once. And then I saw, I think, a, some infomercial on gum disease, got a little frightened, and so I went, and after all those years, I had one cavity. So that was kind of a win. But then, some way, somewhere during that appointment, uh, my dentist asked me a strange question. She said, do you grind your teeth at night? And I said, well, I don't know. My wife says I make some funny sounds sometimes, so why do you ask? She said, well, looking at your teeth through this device, I can see dozens of tiny hairline cracks on the surface of your teeth. I think you might be grinding your teeth. You might want to consider a mouth guard. I said, well, how much does that cost? She said, $300. I said, I think I'm good. <laughs> I didn't really want to spend $300 on a problem I couldn't see or feel. And just about three weeks later, I was munching popcorn, uh, watching TV, and half of a back molar broke, uh, a, a molar broke right in half and fell out of my mouth, right into the popcorn bowl. So I went and got a mouth guard. Turns out my dentist wasn't more than a dentist. She was actually a prophet. And today we... <laughs> Today we begin a, a series of messages uh, that will take us from today all the way through Easter weekend, and our series is called Jesus in the Prophets. Now the prophets and their prophecies are among the most interesting, uh, mysterious, and difficult parts of the Old Testament. And because books like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Obadiah are difficult and a little strange, we often will avoid them. Uh, but they matter. They matter because they are not only ancient, but they are also contemporary. You may be surprised how contemporary some of these ancient words sound. And they tell us about God and his intent and his heart from the very beginning of all things. Now, we tend to think of prophecy uh, kind of like we think about tabloid journalism. For example, there's a self-proclaimed prophet named David Montaigne who just published a book in which he uses a combination of ancient Mayan prophecies and the Bible to predict that the world will end on, you might want to write this down, December 21st, 2019. Okay? Now, the interesting thing about Mr. Montaigne is that he's done this four times before. And he's been wrong every time. And so while there's an element of future prediction in biblical prophecy, prophecy actually functions a little bit more like my dentist did so long ago. There are basically three purposes in biblical prophecy. First, the prophet reminds us of what God has already done or said. In this way, prophecy looks into the past. Uh, the prophet also warns of the consequences of disregarding what God has said. In this way, the prophets are speaking to issues at hand in the present, kind of like my dentist did. And then the prophet also points to the future, to the hope that God has promised to do something that has not yet taken place. So think in terms of three horizons. The prophet spoke and wrote in the present to a real situation. The prophet is pointing to the past, reminding of what God has already said of the covenant he's already established, and then the prophet looks to the future of what God has promised to do. Now, specifically, we're going to be looking over these eight weeks at messianic prophecy. Now, these are prophecies delivered hundreds of years before Jesus was born that point that to Jesus as the promised Messiah of God. Uh, biblical scholars tell us there are upwards of a hundred specific prophecies about Jesus as the Messiah in the Old Testament, written and delivered hundreds of years before he was even born. I read a book a couple years ago about a mathematician who calculated once that the odds of just 11 specific prophecies coming to pass in one person's life of all the people who have lived in human history is something like one in one septillion. That's one followed by 24 zeros roughly the same chance of spring coming early in Illinois. 
It's like building a box, he said, of a volume of 80 cubic miles. So imagine a box that big. I have no idea how big that is, but it's really big. Filling it with dimes, marking one of those dimes with an X, and asking a blindfolded person to dig around there and pull out that single dime on the first try. That's what biblical prophecy is about. So we're going to spend the next few weeks digging into that box and looking at that one dime. And we're starting with a book called Micah. Now, the prophet Micah lived roughly 700 years before Jesus was born. He lived at a time when the nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. There was a northern kingdom, which was called Israel. So think of Wisconsin, okay? There was a southern kingdom that was called Judah. So think of that as Illinois, where we are. Both were threatened constantly by a great enemy that lived even north of that, Assyria. So think Canada. And Syria was led by aggressive warrior-type kings like Tiglath-Pileser III or Sargon II. You can actually look those guys up in secular history books. They really existed because this stuff comes right out of history. It was also a time of great spiritual and moral decline among the Jews. The kings of Israel had allowed the pagan worship of the Assyrians to seep into Israel. There were economic hardships that produced oppression and injustice among the people. And so God sent the prophet Micah to his people to remind them of what he had already said, to remind them of his eternal covenant with them as his people. He sent Micah to warn them of the consequences of ignoring or disregarding or disobeying that covenant and to warn them that judgment would be coming, and it did in fact come, through the Assyrians and through the Babylonians. The northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians in 722 uh, 722 B.C. The southern kingdom, where we are all living in Judah, which I said was Illinois, um, fell eventually in 586 B.C. But judgment... It's not the prophet's final word. Rather, the prophet also points, remember, he points ahead to the promise, the promise of what God is going to do. So that's where we pick it up. Prophet Isaiah, excuse me, Prophet Micah, chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6, and then we'll take a look at what they mean. The prophet writes, Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. Now here he's warning that judgment is coming because of their disobedience. He's warning that the city of Jerusalem will uh, will experience a siege, which actually took place when the Babylonians came in in 586 B.C. Verse 2, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace." When the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses, we will raise against them seven shepherds and even eight commanders who will rule the land of Assyria with the sword, the land of Nimrod with drawn sword. He will deliver us from the Assyrians when they invade our land and march across our borders. So, in summary, things are not good in the southern kingdom of Judah. The nation's kings have become corrupt. Uh, The people and culture have fallen into immorality and idolatry. Their enemies, the Assyrians, are preparing to invade and conquer. Hope seems to be lost. And then comes the voice of the prophet who points to the promise of a king. And that's the first thing we're going to look at today in this prophecy, the promise of a king. Now, we as uh, Americans like to celebrate uh, what we call rags-to-riches stories, You know, stories of people born into very humble circumstances who rise to fame, fortune, and power. For example, stories like Abraham Lincoln, born in a log cabin in Hodgenville, Kentucky in 1809. Now, this is not his actual home. It's actually called his symbolic home. It's in a museum there in Kentucky. Uh, It recreates what they think that log cabin might have looked like. Now, it's hard for us to even imagine how someone could be born in such humble circumstances, to grow up without electricity, without indoor plumbing, without the internet, (laughs) and become someone as famous and as powerful and influential as Abraham Lincoln. 
Historians say as many as nine U.S. presidents were born in log cabins. I did not know that. Including Lincoln, Andrew Jackson, Ulysses S. Grant, and the last one was James Garfield, born in Orange, Ohio in 1831. Now Micah says a great king is going to be born in a surprisingly humble place. Verse 2, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Part of that should sound familiar to you, because we usually hear those words at Christmas time. In Matthew chapter 2 in the New Testament, we read, When King Herod heard this, that a new king had been born, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So Matthew, writing 700 years later, quotes from Micah, and applies the ancient prophecy directly to the birth of Jesus. Remember that big giant box of dimes? That's where we are. A couple of things stand out. Bethlehem was a relatively insignificant place in those days, um, kind of like Hodgenville, Kentucky. Probably never heard of it till today. The word Bethlehem means town of bread. The older name, Ephratha, means fruitful. So Bethlehem uh, was a humble village made up mostly of poor farmers. So Bethlehem was too small to be considered uh, of any political or economic value. Um, And by the way, this is uh, one of the great themes of the Bible, that God chooses the seemingly small, the seemingly ordinary, the seemingly insignificant to accomplish his great purposes in the world. But Bethlehem had already produced one very famous person, and many of you know this. When Micah mentions the town of Bethlehem, people would have immediately thought of King David, who was born in Bethlehem some 300 years earlier and rose to become Israel's greatest and most popular king. And then remembering King David would have caused the ancient Jews also to remember the one they called the son of David, which was the title given to the promised Messiah. Another prophet named Samuel wrote, and said this to King David, 2 Samuel chapter 7, When your days are over, speaking to King David, and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house in my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now the Jews believed that God's anointed one, the Messiah, uh, the one who would be the one who would deliver them from all the threats of their enemies, and that he would come from the house of David, that he, is, he would be a descendant of King David. But there's more here. Micah says, out of you will come for me one who will rule over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Now, literally, the Hebrew there says, whose origins are everlasting from old. Micah tells us, therefore, that Bethlehem is going to produce a king who is a descendant of King David, but who is from everlasting, who existed in the eternal past. Now, how does that make any sense at all? How can one be born who has already existed? Well, here's how. Micah's prophecy is pointing toward the future, to Jesus, who eventually said in John chapter 8, very truly I say to you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Okay, we're back in that big box of dimes again. Now, one more thing. Micah also says, therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she is who in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. Who are the rest of his brothers who are going to return to join the Israelites? Who's he talking about? Scholars believe here that Micah is actually pointing to the spread of the gospel to the non-Jewish or to the Gentile world. And that would be us, of course. So the prophet is saying, a king is coming who will be born in Bethlehem like David, but was before David, and will be greater than David, and will be king not only of Israel, but of the whole world. If we jump back into that great big box of dimes, we see that the New Testament tells us that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that he was a descendant of King David, 
that he existed eternally as the Word. The Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. And he spoke openly about the kingdom of God being fulfilled in him. So Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise of a king. All this coming 700 years before he was born. The second thing we see in this ancient prophecy is that the king who is promised will also be a shepherd. The king will be a shepherd. A few years ago, I was able to make um, a trip with our first team that went to Turkey uh, to in- begin our relationship with that part of the world. And at one point on this trip, we were uh, driving through the, the eastern region of Turkey, which is very, very rural um, countryside hills, and there were uh, scattered about the countryside, we saw uh, sh- this ancient-looking s- site of shepherds in the fields with their sheeps. sheep. It was really interesting to watch. But as we drove by one uh, particular herd that was close to the road, all these sheep, and there was a shepherd that looked like he could have come out of the first century, except for the jarring uh, uh, visual of him on a cell phone. There was an ancient-looking se- shepherd holding a cell phone. This wasn't the actual guy we saw, but it was almost exactly like that. He had a cell phone. There was something about the image that just collided the ancient way of shepherds with modern technology. And here Mike is using colliding images, the colliding image of a king and a shepherd. Now, to say the king would be a shepherd is like saying the CEO of a company is also the security guard, or the president of the country is also the maintenance man of the White House. A king in the ancient world was one with absolute power who lived in great majesty and glory. A shepherd was one who lived out in the fields with sheep. So how does that exactly work? What does the prophet mean? Now, first, the reference of a shepherd here would have immediately reminded the people of Israel of King David, who also, you remember, was a shepherd boy before he killed Goliath and eventually ascended to become king. He was a shepherd. Also would have reminded them of passages like the well-known passage from Psalm 23 that compares God himself to a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. But even so, even with those images... By the time of Jesus, shepherds had come to be seen as kind of a low class of people, uh, socially and religiously. They were of the lower economic class. They lived out in the fields, therefore they couldn't participate in the rituals of their religion and temple sacrifices. They, They were with animals, so they often touched that which was unclean and they couldn't be purified. Uh, So, and they smelled like sheep, you know, they were not seen as attractive members of society. So Mike is pointing to the coming of a king, born in Bethlehem, descended from David, who existed from all eternity, who would not only be a king like David, but would also be a shepherd like David as well. One who would not only have power and authority and majesty, but one who loves and cares for his flock. Again, let's jump back into that great big box of dimes, jump into the New Testament. In John chapter 10, listen to what Jesus said about himself. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Okay, So why does Micah, the ancient prophet, make this point? Why does it matter that the promised king will also be a shepherd? Well, on the one hand, that's what the people of Judah longed for. They longed for a king. And I think the truth is we all all kind of want a king. Now, we wouldn't say it that way. We would say we want a leader, Someone we can trust, someone we can follow. A king is one who rules with power and authority and glory. A king provides direction and security and strength. And we want our leaders to do that, don't we? But we also kind of fear kings. We fear leaders that act like kings. We see this in our own culture all the time because we fear that the king will use his authority and will use his power against us to coerce us, to punish us, but not the shepherd. A shepherd is something much, much different. 
A shepherd is one who lives with his flock. Not in power, not in authority, but in humility and service. A shepherd knows his sheep by name. A shepherd is one who loves and cares for his sheep, and the sheep know him and trust him and follow him. In Luke 15, Jesus tells a beautiful story, one of his his most well-known and well-loved parables. It's a short story about a shepherd who has a hundred sheep. One of those sheep is lost, and the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes out searching searching for the one that is lost until he finds that lost sheep. And every parent knows the power of that story. My wife and I have four children, and many years ago um, I was with them, and I had them by myself in a shopping mall, and uh, somehow I lost one of them. Uh, I just lost one. I didn't know where one was. Now, I didn't say that at that time as a parent, well, I have three still. Three out of four is not too bad. No. If you're a parent, you know what you do, right? You start looking. You start going store to store to store to store, and you search the whole mall, the whole city, if you have to, because you have to find the one that's lost. The prophet is saying, that's how our king is. He's not just a king. He's the shepherd who searches for the lost sheep. And Jesus says, that's how I feel about you. The king who is the shepherd. And the third part we see in this passage is the shepherd is the one who brings peace. The shepherd then will bring peace. Verse 5, and he will be our peace. The Hebrew word for peace there is shalom. Talk about that in a minute. When the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses, he will deliver us from the Assyrians when they invade our land and march across our borders. Now, I want you to remember the horizons of prophecy again. There's the present Here the prophet Micah is talking about the very real threat of the Assyrians that are camped right at the borders that are going to swoop in and lay siege at any time. He's also pointing to the past. He's reminding them of God's covenant with them and how they have disregarded and violated that covenant, covenant. And he's also looking toward the future because he says a king is coming. The king that God has promised is coming and he will also be the shepherd who will bring peace. Now what kind of peace is being talked about here. I mentioned just the word shalom. And the word shalom meant more than political and then economic peace to the ancient Jews. It meant the very presence of God. It meant the very blessing and promise of God fulfilled in their midst. If we jump again to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. So the prophet is telling the people of Judah, and he's telling us that ultimately peace is not found in a government. Ultimately, peace is not found in education. It's not found in politics. It's not found in economics. Peace comes in a person. Peace is found in a person. A person who delivers us, not from the powers of Assyria and Babylon, but from the powers of sin and death. Years ago, a woman in our church asked me if I'd be willing to visit her brother, who had never been to our church and who uh, was at the end stages of a terminal disease and hospitalized. She told me her brother was a good man, but had always struggled um, with faith, was skeptical about organized religion, had lots of questions that he never could reconcile. Um, And she was hoping maybe that uh, if I was willing, I could visit him, and maybe he'd be a little more open at this time in his life. So I visited her brother in the hospital. His name was Tim. He was about in his mid-40s or so, very young to have the disease that he had, uh, and he was very, very sick. He was also open and rather transparent about where he was, what was happening to him. He knew he was dying. So we just talked. We'd never met before. Uh, we didn't talk about all the questions he had. He admitted he had many. I just, we just talked about uh, the promise of the gospel as best we could. I just laid out as clear as I could the, the hope uh, that we can have in Jesus, and after about 30 minutes or so, 
I asked him uh, if I could pray with him before I left. And he surprised me. He said, yeah, you can. And then I said, here's what I'd like to pray for you, if it's okay. I want to pray that you would understand just enough, maybe not all the questions they answer, but just enough that you could trust this promise that Jesus gives you, the promise of eternal life. Can I pray that for you? And to my surprise, he said, yeah, you can do that. So that's what I prayed. And I never saw Tim again. It turns out he passed away about a week or so later. And I learned that through a letter I received from his sister about a week after that. She wrote me that on the day, the very day I had visited, she, uh, he called her from the hospital. And to make a long letter short, what he said to her was, uh, Sis, I know you've worried about me all these years. You don't have to worry about me anymore. The pastor came to see me, and I have peace with God now, he said. Now, I tell that story because that wasn't me. I want you to hear this. That wasn't me. That was the good shepherd chasing down one more lost sheep. That was the one the prophet Micah wrote about 2,700 years ago. That was the king of heaven who is also the shepherd of the sheep who promises to bring peace. I hope you'll stay with us through this journey through the prophets, Jesus and the prophets. We're going to close our time together this morning with the table of the Lord, with communion. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to pray, and after the prayer, the ushers are going to come forward and pass out the trays. Uh, please notice, in each spot, there are two cups stacked. One has the bread, one has the cup. Hold the, the, the cups until everybody is received, and I'll lead us through taking the bread and cup. And please know, this table does not belong to our church. It belongs to the Lord. So even if you're a visitor here for the first time, if you put your faith in Jesus as your shepherd, as your savior, please share the bread and the cup with us. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, how I thank you for your word today, the mystery and power of ancient prophecy. Thank you for the promise of a king. You were king before time began. You are king now, and you will be our king when you come again. But you're more than just our king. You're our shepherd, one who knows us, one who loves us, one who laid down his life for us to bring us peace. Remind us again of your great love through bread and cup. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.